welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from BearMarriage.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence-based biblical advice for your sex life and your marriage. And it is the end of summer, just about. Yes. And I am joined by my daughter, Rebecca, today. Hello. It's been a terrible week. Uh, truly one. Yeah, it's been a bad one. <laughs> it's been a bad one. And so we thought we would just do something this week where we answer a bunch of your questions. Really easy, really fun. Yeah. When you get to know us a little bit better mm-hmm. and we do a special ask. Yes. Because <laughs> we've had we've had a week. Before we do that, I do want to say thank you to our sponsor for the podcast, mm-hmm. which is the Kingdom Girls Bible. It's an NIV Bible specifically made for girls 8 to 12. But honestly, I think it's awesome. It's I don't, really sweet. I don't think it needs to be restricted to girls 8 to no, 12. No, it's really lovely. And the, they've done such an amazing job with the artwork. And yeah. It's just a nice Bible. Um, it's I, I remember when I was, I'll tell you a quick story because this is about you're getting to know us. When I was in junior high, my mom got me a Here, Bible. Let me just show you. Here's the woman of Endor. <laughs> For those of you who have not heard of the woman of Endor. But in, in the Bible, they have like over 400 pictures and stories of different women that appear in scripture so that like girls see themselves in the story. Yeah, because I was going to say I got a Bible from you when I was in junior high that made me so angry and it was kind of the 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 typical idea of a girl's bible from back then um and up until literally like pretty much this bible came out um where all the parts of it that made it be about like for girls is there were quizzes about like what's your shopping style and like uh, are you boy crazy and like how to be uh like a good uh, like should you date or it's all about boys and mm-hmm. shopping and makeup and looks and i actually wrote blog posts about it when i was like 14 being like this is the most vapid thing ever and i actually tore everything out of the bible <laughs> that wasn't just about the bible and almost every single thing that was added to the bible was torn out yeah. so 12 year old me would have been thrilled to have yeah. this bible like, instead is- of a what's your shopping style are like- you a deborah or a rachel <laughs> <laughs> like, like it was the most bizarre thing. So this is like eons better than what any of us had when we were kids. Yeah, it is, and it really, it, it what it really wants t- girls to do is see that there's so many women in the in in the Bible. Yes, even though we often gloss over their stories, and two of my favorite women are, are shown here. Mm-hmm. I, these are my heroines. Okay, Shifra and Pua. Yes, <laughs> the the midwives in the Book of Exodus who saved all the Jewish babies yes. and, and defied Pharaoh. And um, yeah, it, it just, it helps girls see themselves in the story. Um, and it, it has all kinds of other amazing um, parts. So we will, we will share the link to that in the podcast notes. And of course, thank you to our patron group who mm-hmm. has been the rock for us this week. And why don't we share what happened to us? Okay. Which, which one of the things? Well, let's, let's do start. the personal one first. So, Vivian had an accident. Your two-year-old daughter. My two-year-old daughter. daughter, She had an accident and she broke her leg. Yes. Um, And so we spent 10 hours in the ER Mm -hmm. on Wednesday uh, just figuring out, getting x-rays, figuring out what we were going to do. Are we going to splint it? Are we going to cast it? Are we going to stay here, go to a different hospital? And it ended up being a super minor fracture, but still doesn't even if you're in the fracture category you're already in for kind of a bad time so we were dealing with that and uh so now i have an immobile two-year-old for three to four weeks and she's honestly she's doing really well yeah um she was born to be a princess bossing her brother around to go get her stuff um but that that was what happened on wednesday and and in the middle of all this actually it was while you were in the hospital you found out that this happened so on tuesday my facebook business profile got hacked yeah And we could see it happening in real time. We could not get Facebook to pay attention, but they got it. They'd never had my passwords. I never clicked on any phishing email. I think this is honestly a Facebook security glitch. All I did was add my actual email to my business profile. And suddenly multiple people started showing up my business profile and we couldn't get them off. I was, I was taken out of my business profile. Mm -hmm. And so we had about two days where we were afraid the page was going to disappear and get hacked our Facebook page, which has almost a hundred thousand followers that I've been building since 2008. And then while we were in the hospital and I was waiting to hear if my daughter's going to get shipped to a more intense hospital, Mm -hmm. the page was Yes. Yes. So So our Facebook page is has been taken over and they're posting really awful stuff. 
but we have set up a new one. And so this yes. is our big ask, please, everybody. <laughs> you know, we lost 100,000 people, but we've already got, at the time that we're recording this, we've already got about 7.5K. Which is pretty astounding because we've like, been working on it for like 48 hours. Yes, less than 48 hours. So 7.5K, yeah. which is great. Um, but we would love to drive those numbers up even higher. And yes. I just think, you know what? Maybe... God's actually going to do something amazing with this and bring us all kinds of new followers, like mm-hmm. people who haven't heard of us before. If everybody says, if everybody shares, hey, you know, this amazing author that I follow, this amazing podcaster, her Facebook page was hacked, please follow her new one. We're probably going to get new people. Mm-hmm. And so please, please, please follow the new page. It's called Bear Marriage Official. I mean, the, the uh, there also is another small blessing with this, mm-hmm. um, is that the, the people who did hack the page and take it they changed the name immediately yeah which means there's still only one bear marriage right and that means that they're not posting this stuff under our name yeah. which is great mm-hmm. so we, if you search bear marriage on facebook the one that is us is us yeah um and it still looks the same it's got the same banner it's got yep. the same picture of me um <laughs> but please go go take a look we we did put a link in the podcast notes for that mm-hmm. please 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 share it and one of the big things that we realized this week too is one of the reasons this didn't hit us as hard is because we have really big social media followings on Twitter as well, on Instagram as well. We have a really large email list. um, And we have, of course, you all on our podcast. And so um, we don't have all our eggs in one basket. But what that means, please, people, is if you love our podcast, please make sure you're following us in at least one to two other places. Exactly. Because if something ever happens, then you'll still be able to find us and we'll still be able to have you, (laughs) which is really important um, for us. So, So so, you know, make sure you're following us on Instagram or Twitter or threads or wherever. But especially if I could choose any one thing that you could follow us on, it would be our email list. Yeah. Because and for we, anyone who likes me. Yeah. Uh, you're, the email list is kind of the only place that I exist. Yes. Because um, I'm on the podcast every now and then. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the newsletter is is every week I put out an article that's only for the newsletter subscribers. It's 100% me mm-hmm. i write it People sometimes you read like it, it to me first going sometimes, am i going too when, far with and this sometimes you're like yeah you can't put that paragraph in there oh my gosh and i'm like all right that's fair um, <laughs> maybe someday i'll just post all the stuff that you've told me i'm not allowed to post um, but we'll see but but for the most but it's it's something where uh, we get so much good feedback from there like mm-hmm. we have a, like I think about 20,000 people who not only mm-hmm. receive it, but open it and read it every single week. It goes out to way more than that. But anyone who does any email marketing knows that, Yeah, you know, uh, but I think, I think, uh, it's been really fun also for me to get to to get to write a little bit there and yeah have my voice there as well so if you want more snarky rebecca or uh the kinds of things that i often talk about on the podcast there's a bunch there in the newsletter and also people say to me how can i find out where you're speaking sheila and honestly the best place is the newsletter because if you're signed up you will hear when when we're doing speaking events or or events in general so um we will put the link on how to sign up to that in the podcast notes too and please follow us on a couple of other places and please 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 Join us on our new Facebook page. Do that right now. Even just pause this podcast. (laughs) Go and get the link to Facebook and follow us on our new podcast page. Because, yeah, you know what? We just want to be encouraged. It's been a terrible week. So we would just really like to be encouraged. So thank you for that. And I I, I do want to say, we already said it, but I want to say it one more time. Our patron group has just been amazing. Yes. And, you know, when we lost the Facebook page, at least we knew that we had like 500 people in our Facebook group who are so totally on our side and who just went, <laughs> who just went to battle for us yes. and got all their friends to join the new Facebook page. And, um, and that was really encouraging too. And so, you know what? It's $5 a month minimum. Um, you can give more than that if you'd like, and you can be part of our community behind the scenes. Absolutely. Yes. Where we asked for prayer for Vivian's broken leg <laughs> earlier too. Vivi. Yes. So there you go. All right. Would you like to do some questions now? Sure. I put these out on my Instagram stories i said ask me anything because i am so brain dead we cannot prepare (laughs) an entire podcast and we like doing questions we haven't done these in a while well and also i think a lot of times uh the amas kind of allow us to talk to talk about a lot of different topics at once and kind of point you towards where we where we've spoken about this before so Mm -hmm. yeah so here we go so first question ready what is the number one thing that couples should know before intercourse for the first time women can orgasm yeah (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> and uh, they should. <laughs> <laughs> Women can and should orgasm. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> I really think that that's the, if, if that was the number one change, which mm-hmm. is that like her orgasm is the goal mm-hmm. versus just getting it done. Right. Um, I honestly think that would make a big difference. I think the big thing that we've said to a lot of people is that if you're trying to figure out sex as a couple for the first time, like maybe you're on your honeymoon or something, if the goal is to make each other feel good versus the goal being to have sex, Mm -hmm. you're gonna have sex. Yes. Like your body is Mm -hmm. designed when it's super aroused to want to do the do. Okay. (laughs) So if you're, if you, if you focus more on, you know, arousal and her orgasm through whatever means you want, frankly, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, and I think it's a really good rule to maybe even not have intercourse until you've figured out her orgasm piece. Yeah. I think just going based on arousal patterns, which I, I would Mm -hmm. looking at all of the research Mm -hmm. would struggle to think that orgasm, that intercourse first is the best way to follow her arousal patterns. Yes. And we have some amazing new stats on this that I am so excited to share with you. We're not going to do it yet. Um, It's part of our marriage book. We have a big box on this on who orgasms when if you wait for sex for marriage Mm. um, and how lopsided it is. Seriously, it it was even worse than I thought. I bet you women have five orgasms to every one orgasm (laughs) their husbands have. I bet you that's what we found, right? And this is why we have to change the way we're doing the honeymoon. Um, And so that book, The Marriage You Want, is coming out in March. Keith and I co-wrote it. It is the marriage book we wish we had that uh, we just, we said, if you're going to write about marriage from the ground up, build something healthy, what's it going to look like? Mm -hmm. And it looks nothing like love and respect. It looks nothing like The Excellent Wife or any of the marriage books that we so often look at. It's just based on evidence. It's based on emotional health. It's based on everything we know about mental load, emotional labor, et cetera. And I'm so proud of it. Also just common sense. Yeah. uh, Yes. And so we will, you can pre-order it now. Um, If you go on Amazon, we'll be doing a big push for pre-order soon, but, but that is coming out and we will have a lot of stuff about first time you have sex. But I will say in our books, let me just grab them. The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex and The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, which should be the bridal shower gifts, people. Like if everybody got these books when they are engaged in 10 years, nobody would need The Great Sex Rescue. (laughs) And that is our goal. So, um, you know, but in these books, we talk a lot about how to do sex um, the first time so that it, it, it puts you on a good trajectory. Um, one thing I will say is, I, I totally agree with you that, that what I would say is women's orgasms exist mm-hmm. and should happen. It's so hard though to give that same message if someone's been married for 12 years and hasn't had an orgasm because it's like you don't want people to feel like they're failing, but like you really need to get there. And that's why like you can give that message when they're just starting out, when they haven't got any bad habits yet. Um, But it's really hard to undo bad habits. Mm -hmm. And there's so much baggage like with women feeling they're broken and internalizing obligation sex messages. So it's like... And then performance anxiety as well. Like like if you're like, well, we're trying to figure this out now I feel like there's so much pressure. Yeah. So like, let's just get this right from the ground up. I think that's so much better. Okay. Here's another one. You want to read it? Sure. What to do if you're scared of going to the doctor for painful sex? You know what? There's not an easy answer for that. Like there's, there's not an easy route to this. Sometimes life is hard. Also weirdly, this might sound really weird, but you can also ask if you could bring a sister or a friend Mm -hmm. to hold your hand Yeah, (laughs) or your husband. Um, Some places might not allow you to bring your spouse because it might be uh, screening you for abuse. Yeah. Um, But you might be allowed to bring a support person or, or have someone there for the actual examination, but then they might want to talk to you privately as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can ask. Yeah. Here's what here. And and here's what I think people need to understand too, is we talk a lot about vaginismus here Mm -hmm. because uh, it's a big part of our research. We know that evangelical women suffer at two to two and a half times the rate of the general population. We found an incidence rate of 23%. And vaginismus is a sexual dysfunction disorder where the muscles in the vaginal wall contract or become super tight, which makes penetration really painful, if not impossible. The thing is, that's not necessarily the only reason you could have pain. It mm-hmm. is the main reason, but you could also have um, a hymen, a really thick hymen that, it, that, that isn't broken perforated, so it, yeah. yeah perforated hymen um you could have lichen sclerosis which mm-hmm. is sort of an autoimmune autoimmune disease which can really affect that there's other forms of sexual pain and so 
you know, well, the go-to treatment for vaginismus would be a pelvic floor physiotherapist. And honestly, doctors are, I, I'm married to a doctor, so I can say this, but they're notoriously bad at treating some things because they weren't <laughs> trained in it. This isn't their yeah. specialty. Um, it is pelvic floor physiotherapy specialty. Yeah. So a doctor might be able to tell you, yep, that's just vaginismus. You can go to a pelvic floor physiotherapist. But it, I would actually argue often that the pelvic floor physiotherapist pelvic floor physiotherapist might be more able to tell you if yeah. you should go to see your doctor. That's actually true. Maybe the pelvic um, floor because physiotherapist the, should the, be the first, the first. I I actually like I, from personal experience from seeing them like they're so uh knowledgeable about mm-hmm. especially if it's postpartum that's where a lot of this stuff starts up for a lot of people yeah or even just regular like if you're like i don't know we're just kind of newly married and stuff isn't working like right. go see someone who specializes in women women's health issues yeah and they might say yeah no this is not a physiotherapy issue this is something where you probably just need to get some medication that'll work or you should see a dermatologist yeah. or something like that they actually do know a lot of that too it doesn't hurt to have two opinions yeah yeah i would i would so. totally second that um, I would also say, just picking up on the postpartum thing, many women don't have pain at all, and then they have a baby. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're looking at rates of around 35% uh, sexual pain yep. uh, postpartum. And in that instance, evangelical women aren't necessarily worse off than the general population. We found about equivalent. It's just the primary sexual pain. But but you can get pain disorders if, you know, you had tearing, you had scar tissue, and it didn't heal well. There's all kinds of reasons. <laughs> even just, even if there was nothing, quote unquote, wrong with the delivery, even mm-hmm. just like the, the muscular trauma that does yes. happen yeah. um, can cause your pelvic floor to kind of reset in a in not healthy mm-hmm. way or start mm-hmm. to have tightening in some areas. So um, the good news is if you are someone who has secondary uh, pain, the vast, 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 vast majority of people get full recovery very quickly yeah we did do a podcast probably about two years ago now with a pelvic floor physiotherapist and i will link it in the podcast notes so that you can listen to that the other thing i want to say on this one is um a lot of times vaginismus what we found in our survey a big cause of it is the obligation sex message because women don't feel like they have agency over their bodies Mm -hmm. and and that was my story because i had vaginismus and going to a doctor who then told me you know, that they were going to have me sit with my feet up in the stirrups while they touched me and then with a mirror and I touched, it's like, okay, I don't have agency anymore either. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes going to a physician can be so scary because your whole thing is, I just want agency over my body. And now the physician isn't giving you any either because I have to get naked. And that's where pelvic floor physiotherapists are really good at handling that. Yeah. Because they they get it. They get it. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That one good? Yep. Oh, and we do cover sexual pain a lot in The Great Sex Rescue. Absolutely. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking of our study in The Great Sex Rescue, <laughs> here is another question. Is there a need for a new field of study for sexual issues in evangelical circles, Rebecca? I mean, yeah. That, I, I think we're filling a lot of that need, yes. but it would be great if we're not the only ones. I yeah. think that we aren't the only ones either, which is so great. Well, a while ago, uh, we put out a call for people who were interested in publishing research to work with us so that they could publish. Um, mm-hmm. Like under, like they'd get to have published papers under their name using our data set, and our data set would also then just have more and more uh, kind of peer-reviewed juice behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got so many people who are now working with us who are amazing researchers in their fields who are mm-hmm. looking at sexuality and evangelicalism. So I think that this is this is um, expanding. Yeah, I think that it's necessary because of the health risks and that are that we have found to be in evangelical culture. Yeah, and I'm hoping that stuff is going to change as more awareness happens and so if you also want to help with that best thing you can do is give people a great sex rescue yep and we also um are raising money to keep doing this to keep mm-hmm. to keep funding more studies so you can give if you are in the u.s you can get a tax deductible receipt through the bosco foundation mm-hmm. um that we are the good fruit faith initiative and we'll put the link to the podcast notes but the bosco foundation or the good fruit faith initiative of the bosco foundation managed mm-hmm. to uh fund a bunch of our scholarships so that a lot of people are working on this and we have some really good news for that to share with you probably in a couple of weeks maybe yeah, in a month probably. on the podcast we'll see. we'll see okay body image issues when the wife weighs more than the husband I mean, this is so hard when we're when we're raised to, in essence, believe that you deserve to be loved if you're small, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think the first question that I would have for people who have massive body image issues when they weigh more than their husband is, is this because of something your husband said mm-hmm. or what society said? Because like I will be I know a lot of like a lot of examples in re- like in just 
culture in real life where like the wife is like oh i feel so horrible and he's like yeah <laughs> that's a woman <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, so i guess my my first question would be you know you have permission to be loved how you are and mm-hmm. if you're married to someone who's like i think you're hot just let me think you're hot <laughs> then just let him think you're hot okay yes. like maybe this is a great way to kind of unlearn the negative conditioning that you were given mm-hmm. in grade seven and grade nine and grade 11 and at 25 mm-hmm like this is this is uh maybe an opportunity where you know you your marriage and your relationship can be can be something that heals that inner child that's really what i would say yeah and i also think you know what the idea that a woman's body is going to look always perpetually 22 is so ridiculous Mm -hmm. like we have babies. Yeah. <laughs> Our bodies really change. And when even we have if we babies. don't have babies, the hormonal changes that women go through throughout their lives are very different. Yeah, than the hormonal I gain, I've gained men. ten pounds in the last year, and I th- really think it's menopause. Like yeah. I d- like, like there's no other reason for well, it. The, that, that's exactly it. Is is women's bodies fluctuate in mm-hmm. in a way that men's bodies just simply don't in the same way hormonally. It doesn't mean obviously every individual is different, but like you you also can give yourself grace because Mm -hmm. if you're asking something of yourself that is biologically not how you're wired Mm -hmm. that is setting yourself up to fail so yeah yeah, that's that's really what i would say is and and also you know you have the right to enjoy your body and having great sex can let you enjoy your body which can help you love your body more and if you're if you have such body image issues that you're don't feel like having sex it's like you're letting those 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 issues steal from you the joy that you could have in your body which is just and I know that's not easy. I, I I know I'm making it sound super easy and I know it's not, but just keep telling yourself truth, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that you deserve to be loved. You deserve to take up space and that you deserve, especially, especially for the women whose husbands don't have a problem. Like, mm-hmm. this is, and this is, this is like a, most, mm-hmm. most people, I think, like allow yourself to believe what your spouse says about mm-hmm. you if they're if they're telling you actually those voices in your head are wrong like i think you're beautiful i love you the way that you are i love that you have a giant butt like, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> you you get permission like to believe that, that voice. Cannot lie. yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> you know you have permission to listen to that voice and if your husband is is getting on your back because you've gained 10 pounds um and you're now like 125 instead of oh 115 gosh. and i've had a lot of emails like that yeah you know? that's true gosh um that's a that's a him problem that's not a you problem and that is that is that is something that you need to talk to a therapist about that's something that isn't healthy oh yeah no that's horrifying yeah okay do you want to do dating now or do you sure. want to do church now? Let's do dating. Dating. Okay. We have two dating questions. And thank you again to everyone on Instagram who answered. I know we're not getting to everybody's questions, but mm-hmm. I just chose the ones I thought Becca would like. So how do you vet a guy in the dating process? Are there quality ones out there? Please tell me there are. I think it's what she was trying to say. Mm-hmm. And how do we tell? I mean, I think a really big one that's often undersold is their friends and like peer group. Mm-hmm. Um, like when you know a guy's friends, you know him mm-hmm. to a certain extent. And this goes for women too, right? Like when you know who someone is around, you know that, oh, so they attract this kind of person. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Everyone around this guy is a total <laughs> butt <Yeah. laughs> and makes stupid jokes and crass jokes and is super irresponsible and lazy and uh, kind of misogynistic and everyone is like if, if if all and he's like man he's such a good influence for his friends is he mm-hmm. or is he just like showing off for you and then in 10 years of marriage this is who he really is yeah because in general like people who are good people tend to have good people around them mm-hmm. right um people who are selfish immature and lazy tend to uh, repulse people who are not so if he's constantly surrounded by people who you cannot stand, who mm-hmm. you think are just actually kind of bad people, mm-hmm. who are really immature, who he becomes a worse person when he's around them, that to me is a massive red flag. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's really easy to act like someone different when you're on dates and you're on your best behavior. Um, but if you can really just become a part of the social group, not just hang out with his friends sometimes like no 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 i am part of this now yeah and you can see if you fit or not um yeah. that can be that can be helpful 
Yeah, I have a couple of big things to say on this. First of all, there are there's some really good techniques if you're doing online dating of weeding people out. We're not going to talk about those right nope. now. We might do an entire podcast on it at some point. Guess I don't know who like talks about this. Yeah, because because yeah. there there are there are actual techniques, and I know so many people who have married um, from online relationships, and they're really good. Yeah. Now some haven't worked, but that's true of every relationship. Mm-hmm. But you know, online can really work. So, um, but yeah, you do need to be picky. And I would just say with online, let everything hang out at the beginning mm-hmm. because if it's not going to work you want to know that quickly so that you can get on with other people so yeah. if there are things that are non-negotiable let them know up front but I think um, a couple of things about in person and one is to pick up on what you were saying Becca social groups matter mm-hmm. most of us who marry marry someone through a friend of a friend or mm-hmm. it's part of your broader social network so the bigger social network you can get the better and sometimes I think we're so focused on finding someone to date that we ignore just growing your social circle well especially since like even if you do get married or if you don't get married that community is going to be a lifeline no matter what yeah um like making friends and being a part of a larger group and having people you can text if something happened and mm-hmm. people you can call if all of a sudden you're, you're like well, my apartment has black mold and I have to move on Tuesday. Yes. Like having those people is so important and it, yes. it's not less important when you're married either. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's not a bad idea no matter what to really focus on community. And then when you find a community that you really fit in, someone's got a brother or cousin or hopefully (laughs) Hopefully. you know um and so work on that the other thing is don't let your whole relationship be dates go grocery shopping together make a meal together do life as much as you can yeah uh, clean out you know your your garden in the spring (laughs) or Or something like, like i think and i think the big thing that i've seen a lot of people do really really well is just in essence once you're dating it it becomes like a i just we 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 swap we just go to each other's houses and hang out and do nothing too Mm -hmm. right where it's like what do you do on a daily basis do i fit in this rather than like oh and then here we have an outing where we are doing this yeah we have an outing where we are doing that um just making sure that you're just comfortable always being there because if yep. you get married hey heads up that's how it's gonna be yeah so see how they live are they capable of cleaning up after themselves and if they're not are they capable of learning and are they excited yeah, about learning so exactly. so those are some things i would say okay and to go along with that one mm-hmm. someone asks when i'm on dates with men what are some questions i can ask to suss out church misogyny <laughs> Ask them who their favorite authors are. <laughs> well, I think that's 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 hard because it depends on what kind of genres they read and all this different stuff. Yeah. I think I think that there's no one answer. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest here. I think anyone who talks about how they want a white... There's major red flags, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure there's green flags. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like there's, there's the ones where it's like, you know, what are you looking for in a wife? Well, I'm looking for someone to obey me, <laughs> to clean my... To do, you know, that you're traditional. If you use any words like traditional... Mm-hmm. It's probably a red flag because guys who are open to like a stay at home mom situation aren't going to be like, I'm, I want a stay at home mom. If they want a stay at home mom situation, we have to ask why. Mm-hmm. Ask bigger questions, right? Versus, yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with saying, I want a parent to stay at home or I want our kids to be cared for by parents as that's much as possible. Exactly why. But if it's only the mom, exactly. then that's an issue. It's like, no, if I make, if I make half the amount of money that you make and you make double, you still stay home because otherwise I will feel like I, I am small man. Yeah. It's like, no, that's a red flag, <laughs> that's a red right? Flag. So yes. I mean, like, there's some like red flags or it's like if she believes that women are not able to lead mm-hmm. or if he would feel uncomfortable with a woman teaching him something like yeah. those kinds of things. But the problem is like on dates, just I don't think that's the best time to figure this out because mm-hmm. they're on their best behavior. They know the buzzwords like you're just going to mm-hmm. have to watch. Yeah, I do think that seeing what kind of church they go to does help there are lots of people who go to very very sexist churches who are not themselves sexist Mm -hmm. um but also that is something that they then have to prove a lot more yes um and there's a lot of people who haven't thought it through and that's exactly this is the thing if you grow up in a sexist church you know a lot of men are like you know what i want to get married and i want to be such a good spiritual leader and they mean that in the best sense of the word they mean you know these are typically the men who read great sex rescue and realize i am free yeah i get to just (laughs) like my wife i don't have to anxiously worry about how i'm failing my family every 20 minutes yes those are those men the ones who grew up in like a super fundamental 
fundamentalist church or super sexist church and just kind of believed, I want to be a good person, but gosh, this sounds horrible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then we get emails from people, from guys who say, I, I got one this week. Um, I, a woman sent me a picture of screenshot of the yeah. text messages from her husband. And he said, you know, I am, I've listened to three and three quarters episodes of Bare Marriage and I'm wrecked. I'm yeah. just wrecked. Exactly. We have done this so wrong and I'm so sorry and I want to change. And, you know, there's guys like that out there who would change if they just heard the right message. And so it's like just because someone wants to be a spiritual leader doesn't mean they're a misogynist. They might have just grown up. That might be the language of their church culture. Right. right. And but but the real question is, are they are they willing to learn from a woman? Are they willing to talk about these issues? How do they react to the Bare Marriage podcast? Yeah. How a they lot react of, to our I podcast. will say a lot of people who are dating use us as a litmus test and yes. it seems to work pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So there um, you go. Yeah. OK, here's a quick one. Have you talked about Intended for Pleasure? We read it 20 years ago and I don't remember what I'm hearing now. So here's the thing. <laughs> What this person has accidentally done is told us that they have not bought our book. They have not read our book because we do, in fact, talk quite a bit about Intended for Pleasure in The Great Sex Rescue. So if you are interested in hearing direct quotes from Intended for Pleasure and our discussion about that book, you should buy The Great Sex Rescue for a very fun time. Honestly, it is so... Ch I don't know if this will still be true at the point where this podcast goes live, but for the last three weeks, Great Sex Rescue on Amazon has been like $9 in paperback. Yeah, it's so cheap That right is now. like cheap, as cheap as I can buy it for. As yeah. The author so this is this is super cheap i i don't this is an amazon thing so i have no idea when it's going to end yeah they don't tell us but if you are listening to this go to amazon right now and see because if it is still that cheap pick up a whole bunch because <laughs> you're going to want to give them out like candy but if you want to know what we said about intended for pleasure that's yes. our answer buy our book because yes. we worked hard on it we wrote our <laughs> critiques well in there and it's there and we also have um our rubric with a scorecard of all the books we talk about yes in, in great sex rescue and so you can download that rubric um if you want to see specifically all the things about intended for pleasure and love and respect and power of a praying wife and for mm -hmm. women only and Everything. Everything. Um, I will put the link to the, our rubric in the podcast notes too. Okay. Shall we do a couple on churches? Sure. Oh, right. Here's a woman who says, how can we help those we know who have wound up stuck in a cult? And I think this is coming out of our podcast last week with Bethany Jancy when we were mm. talking about some of the cult-like yeah. elements of so many um, evangelical churches, especially when it comes to marriage. I would say don't leave their daily life. Mm -hmm. like don't this is not right now this is not an ideological battle for you yeah. um you're not gonna find a cult expert who says that you should argue someone out of a cult yeah you're not gonna find one mm -hmm. what you need to do is be a pillar in their life yeah. so that if the cult tries to make you leave they're gonna be like well i can't right right like yeah. you are the person who will take their kids when they have a dentist appointment you are mm -hmm. the person who um mm -hmm. will say hey i made extra and i heard you guys had a hard week do you want me to drop off a lasagna you yeah. are the person not in like a creepy way but like in a normal neighbor nice community way mm -hmm. you are like always like love this picture you guys look wonderful like be super encouraging be like i'm on your side i'm mm -hmm. here um and and then if they start to have questions, you're the person that they can turn to yep. with that, right? Like don't don't hide what you believe, but don't push it on them and don't push the conversations. In fact, I would actually argue that if they try to argue with you and prove that you're wrong, you say, hey, I really respect our friendship. I don't want to get into an argument that I don't think you're going to convince me of. So can we just talk about something else? Yeah. And then if they come to you with questions, mm -hmm. and you can say, if you ever have questions about what I believe, I'm happy to explain it. But like, I want to make sure you know that I just I just want to be with you. Yeah. Right? And if you do feel like you want to express some sort of like if you're really worried to be yeah. abused or something, the best way to do that isn't to say, I think you're being abused. It's to say, huh, I'm noticing some things. What do you think of this? Like ask them questions. Or if you have the relationship because you've mm -hmm. put in the work, you can say, I love you. I am only saying this because I'm worried about you and I love you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to here's what I, I want you to read. Is it me by Natalie Hoffman? Yeah. Right. Because I'm seeing a lot of stuff here and and then if you ever need to talk about anything, I'm here. I'm not going to badger you about this, mm -hmm. um, but I need to say my piece. And yeah. I would love to, like you, like you, you, if you have the relationship, you can, you can have those conversations. Yeah. But I think a lot of times what often happens is there's not the relationship there. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's the full attack. Um, mm -hmm. Or it becomes an ideological warfare instead of remembering that the main thing that gets people out of these cults is either stuff goes really, really bad for them. Mm -hmm. or their friend group doesn't fit with it. Yeah. 
So you can you can be there, be the pillow for her to land on if, if it's number one, but also you can be the reason that number two occurs. Yeah. And I would say this is a little bit different on social media. Um, yeah. When you're on social media with a friend who's in a cult, please don't argue with them on social media. Please do not do that. Yeah. Okay. But if you're in a Facebook group with like 40,000 people that you don't know in real life, by all means argue. Yeah, because that <laughs> might be the person who's trying out things and who's testing and who someone else is being the friend being like, I just need someone to talk some sense into this girl. Yeah. Like it's, it's yeah. just, it, it's, it's different when you're, when you're like online versus your in-person people and you have different roles based on where you are in yeah. that person's life. Yeah. Your role, your role is not to argue with someone you know in real life, but yeah. you might be the one who, if, when you share, when you share links to, to our podcast, when you share about Great Sex Rescue, when you share about Marg Mousko or whoever else that we recommend um, in some of these big Facebook groups, you may be the one who gets people going on the tantrum. I have exactly. heard from so many people who were on the Facebook page of She Who Will Not Be Named. Yes. Um, who found me even on She Who Will Not Be Named because somebody was bad mouthing us. Yes. And they were... <laughs> And they wanted to see what we were saying. Uh huh. I'm pretty sure that's the kind of stuff that keeps she who what she who will not be named up at night, which yeah. I find pretty funny. Yeah, exactly. Okay, here's one for you. Okay, ready? You Is there a way to homeschool without all the fundy or fear based baggage? absolutely the answer is you do it like yeah. I'm sorry that's that's a pedantic answer but here's mm -hmm. the thing it is so uh, I'm I'm someone for anyone who doesn't know I'm planning on homeschooling my kids my husband was actually all I was homeschooled growing up yeah you I, I homeschooled you and Katie mm -hmm. all through high school like yep. and yeah. yeah yeah I started in grade one went all the way through um, my husband was actually also homeschooled in a secular family for mm -hmm. six years mm -hmm. I think growing up um, so this is not homeschooling is is typically kind of seen as like a Duggars thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where like you're doing it because the evils of the public school system are going to like infiltrate our children's brains, yes. and then they're all gonna you know be like you know not not uh, they're all gonna be Marxist feminists. exactly Marxist feminists exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think my big thing to get out of the mentality of trying to keep your kids away from from like the the evils of the public school system, which I'm sorry I'm making light of that, but I I do find it very frustrating because I've seen how bad that goes. Mm -hmm. What I would say is really focus on what you're giving your children and focus on it with your education. Yeah. Uh, um, focus on how do I give my children the best education possible. Um, your children do not need to be sheltered from like science um they do not need mm -hmm. to be even if you want to teach them something that scientists don't agree with mm -hmm. if you are not teaching your child what scientists do agree with you are now keeping your child back you're going to make it harder for them to get jobs you're going to make it mm -hmm. harder for them to go into secondary uh, studies if they mm -hmm. uh, into um like universities if they want to so instead of doing the fundy fear-based homeschooling which is about um uh, you know, usually it tends to be about I teach the Bible, not science. And mm -hmm. I teach uh, and, and it becomes very much about a lot of culture wars situations. Mm -hmm. Focusing on why are you doing this and doing and finding it, uh, focusing on why you're doing this and having those reasons not be based on what you don't want to happen, but what you do want to happen. Mm -hmm. And then looking for homeschoolers in your area who are secular homeschoolers is really, really great. I have actually found that most people in secular homeschooling groups are also religious, <laughs> but they're homeschooling from a secular perspective, which is what I, I'm, I'll let you know. That's what we are doing. Mm -hmm. We're giving our children a secular education as Christians. Yeah. Right. And that's what I did for you. That's too. what you did as well. We did study Bible. We did have Bible as a, as a subject. But, yeah. yeah but mm -hmm. our spelling curriculum wasn't like how do you spell like the abednego like yeah, <laughs> yeah. right um yeah. and our math curriculum wasn't like how many animals were on the ark uh, yes. like so so like that's the thing is like we were doing we're doing a uh, 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 an education that will equip them for the real world mm -hmm. um and so look for others who are doing the same thing. There are so many. These groups are getting bigger and bigger. The area where we live now had so, like pretty much didn't have a secular homeschooling group when we were being yeah. homeschooled. Yeah. Now there's a bunch of us. We yeah. have a whole group just ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been really lovely because it's been a great community. So that's what I would say is focus on what you are giving your kids instead of what you're trying to shield them from. Because I will also say, I'm, this is, sorry, this is one of my soapboxes, so I do need to say this. If you're focusing on shielding your kids from stuff, um, I have typically seen that the education is not as good. Yeah. Because you're focusing on what they're not doing and you're and they're reveling and like, oh, but my kid is getting to enjoy this for longer. I'm like, okay, that's great. They also need math. 
Mm -hmm. Um, They also need to know how to spell. Mm -hmm. So focusing on what you are giving your kids um, academically is very, very important. And not just patting yourself on the back that they're not getting the Marxist feminist agenda. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and be careful about curriculum you use. There's a lot of fundamentalist curriculum. I would argue that you should be, this is one of the shoulds that I will say, Mm -hmm. whenever possible, you should be using a secular curriculum. Like Saxon math. And and I know there's different opinions on Saxon, but like, for instance, Saxon instead of something that, Yeah. yeah, that is, yeah. I, the the big thing that I always say with homeschooling is you need to be give homeschooling in order to give your child more opportunities, not fewer opportunities. Exactly. And so you guys took so much piano. Yep. Um, well, and the big thing too is a lot of the people who I know who are doing it from the secular perspective, their kids are neurodivergent or they have learning disabilities. And so mm-hmm. they're like, hey, you know what? This kid is going to learn better in a less stressful environment and they have the ability to do that, right? So that's yeah. that's a big mm-hmm. one too. Even if it's not like extra bonus things are added on, sometimes yeah. just that you're able to do it because it's yeah. not a good fit otherwise, right? So there's a lot of reasons to homeschool other than... Mm-hmm oh no, they might see people who don't wear skirts. Yes. But <laughs> right. at the same time, we are not a podcast which says you need to homeschool. It, it, uh, that was the next thing I was going to yes. say <laughs> is the biggest, the biggest hurdle to getting over the fundy baggage is understanding the public school is not the enemy. Yeah. And mm-hmm. understand that public school is not a bad choice. It's just a different one. That's the number one hurdle to get over. All right. We have a couple of other questions about church. Okay. Okay. Ready? We have, we have actually, this was, this was the biggest group of questions, which I was kind of surprised of when I, when I said, Hey, everybody ask me anything. It, a year ago when I said that, or two years ago when I said that everything would be about sex mm-hmm. and now almost everything is about church. Mm-hmm. Like I would say a good two thirds of my questions were about how to find a good church, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Yes. I think, I think our audience is like, okay, we got the sex thing down because <laughs> we've been listening yes. to you and reading the great sex. We recipe. know it's supposed to be good. Okay. But <laughs> you know, we want to be in a religious place with people like you. How do we find yeah. people like you in our religious place? Um, so here's a, here's a question. How do you know if a church subscribes to some of these toxic ideas on sex and marriage? Um, a couple of things. First of all, what is their church leadership like? You know, if your church leadership is only men, that is going to tend to be a red flag Mm -hmm. because beliefs about obligation, sex, about male entitlement tend to go hand in hand with the idea that men are over women and there's a hierarchy. So if your church has a a gender hierarchy, they are going to tend to also have a hierarchy when it comes to sex and marriage. Um, Now, there are some good churches or some churches that have a hierarchy that actually teach healthy stuff on sex. I've I've heard about that. I heard about one church which has put out... (laughs) resources on why you can still be a complementarian and read the great sex rescue because so many of their people love the great sex rescue and the church loves it but they're like but but we're complementarian so um you know they're trying we 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 support people um helping their their congregants reading things outside of their own ideological bubble i think that's great i think that's wonderful always support um but but in general those things tend to go together one thing you can do when you're trying out a new church is check out their website first not all churches have like great websites but a lot of them do check out what resources do they recommend because you can often find under resources pages like books they recommend um or counselors they recommend if all of their counselors are biblical counselors and mm-hmm. not licensed that's counselors, a massive red flag if the books they recommend are the books that we say are harmful then this is a church which either is openly and deliberately teaching male hierarchy or they've never thought about it. And so they are passively teaching male mm-hmm. hierarchy. And, and and it might be one of those things where, again, like stuff like the Great Sex Rescue was a great litmus test. Where it's like, hey, I saw that you're doing some stuff that, you know, we all agreed was the best stuff 20 years ago. But now there's been new research coming out that shows that it's actually not Christ-like at all. It's not even biblical. Would you mind reading this book and seeing if we can change what we're recommending and how we talk about this? A lot of people have done that. And their pastors are like, this is a great book. Oh, my gosh. This makes so much more sense. This is always what I thought. But no one else is saying it. So that that is. I, unfortunately, mm-hmm. many of these answers are you're going to have to stick your neck out a little bit mm-hmm. um, because because this toxic stuff is so in the culture. A lot of people are just parroting back the culture yeah. and they haven't really been shown. And, and also, as much as I hate this fact, mm-hmm. and, and I'm so sorry if this offends any pastors who are listening. Pastors are so head in the sand about what's actually going on in real people's lives mm-hmm. so often. Um there's like when you look at the kinds of books pastors are reading it's typically very heavy theology stuff it's about like the meaning of forgiveness and meaning grace and that's like great that's great for you but like the average congregant 
who's having like who's who's trying is not reading a book on forgiveness they're reading the bestseller evangelical self-help books which Mm -hmm. the pastors are not reading yeah so you might have a pastor who's like all about grace and patience and the fruit of the spirit who's like oh and i guess these christian books on marriage are what i should be shoving shoving people's way he hasn't read them in the same way Mm -hmm. um and i i find that very frustrating Mm -hmm. but i also understand why it happens um but that that's the thing where if you confront Mm -hmm. the pastor with the reality that he might not know um, or because I'm going to be honest, most female pastors I know already know this. That's why I'm using the he for pastor here is because yeah. I have yet to meet a female pastor who's like truly mm-hmm. in the most female pastors are well aware that there are people who don't think that they should be pastors. Yes. <laughs> um, and so if you if you have someone who's kind of been passively doing this, just opening their eyes and see if they want their eyes to be opened. And if they're like, oh, well, let's just change this up because that does happen a lot. It does. And our Great Sex Rescue Toolkit is a great way to do that. We created um, a toolkit with printable downloads or you can just email and forward them. They're super pretty. Mm-hmm. They're really well designed. It's like two to three to four pages explaining what is wrong with all of the different toxic teachings mm-hmm. that we have looked at. So there's there's one, two or three page handout on the modesty message, one on obligation sex, one on all men struggle with lust, um, so many of them. And then also all of our one sheet downloads on the books that are problematic and how to approach your pastor and more. Yeah. So, you know, if you're wondering on how to start these conversations, we will put a link to the Great Sex Rescue Toolkit. It's pay what you can. So you can get it for as little as $3. But if you want to pay more and give us some extra cash to keep doing what we're doing, we really appreciate that, by the way. Yeah. Um, You can do that as well. So put a link to that. Okay. Last church question. Mm -hmm. Why continue to be a part of a church after experiencing or seeing so much hurt? And I know you have some thoughts on this. Yeah, we've talked about this a lot in the patron group. So our patrons will be well aware of our of our opinion on this, which is, as always, we have to go to the evidence, mm-hmm. right? So when we've experienced something big, it's very easy to assume that everything is like that, right? And that's that's a natural guarding mechanism that our brains have. Mm-hmm. Um, anxiety and um, overblown risk assessment is actually a protective thing that our brains have developed to mm-hmm. make sure that we don't do dumb things um, mm-hmm. that will get us hurt, right? So uh, if we did something and it hurt us, we are reticent to do it again. Yes. Um, so same thing with church. So what we have to do is go to the evidence. Yeah. Right? So if you've gone to a church and you've been hurt, your brain, your body, your trauma responses are going to say, it's not worth investing in this anymore. Exactly. It's not worth trying to find a healthy church. And that isn't something that we're going to chastise you for. That's how your brain's created mm-hmm. to do. But what I found very helpful with a lot of this stuff is to go to the evidence. The evidence states that religiosity is beneficial. It just is. Um, you're not going to find something that shows that mm-hmm. religiosity is harmful. What's harmful is when religiosity is used to coerce or control or when it's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, really tied up with conservatism. And I don't mean political, like just politically, like that's a, that's a scientific term, conservatism, which is like fundamentalism. Mm-hmm. In essence, like this idea of all or nothing rules follow versus the concepts of, you know, what Christ uh, called us to do or how to be like him, how to follow him, the fruits of the spirit, what it means to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Those kinds of things are not are not in the fundamentalism. Yeah. And and study after study after study has shown this, like the Harvard, the Harvard longitudinal study is mm-hmm. a really famous one now. They started studying um, men after World War II and the, it's continued to look at their spouses, their kids and even their grandkids now. And religiosity is a positive force. Church attendance is positive. We said this a lot um, when she deserves better came out, mm-hmm. we we because it, it's nuanced, and I want you guys to hear this. Like church attendance is good, yes, on the whole, until you internalize these toxic teachings or you get into a space which is really authoritarian, mm-hmm. um, controlling, dehumanizing, objectifying, and then. <laughs> The benefits of church disappear, but it's not that church is bad. It's that those other things are bad and there are spaces, religious spaces that are healthy. Yeah, there are many where it's really more about community versus these kind of toxic teachings. And it can be so hard to believe that when that's not your personal experience. But again, that's why we like data so much. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, oftentimes our personal experience is just not indicative of the whole. Yeah. Right? Like that's just reality. 
But I mean, I, I got through, I went through a lot of church trauma. I, I find going into certain church services now very triggering. Mm-hmm. I do. But I also have found a church that I feel very safe in. Exactly. But it's a different kind of church. Yeah. And you might have to try a different kind of church. We hear all the time from people, you know, I went to First Baptist Church for seven years and I was massively burned. And so then I went to Second Baptist Church and we were there for like 10 years and it was amazing. But then I was burned at Second Baptist and then I went to Third Baptist and Fourth Baptist. And, and we're like, okay, so maybe, <laughs> maybe there's the common denominator here, right? Yeah. Like if you've been, if you are still in this mindset that only one denomination has a monopoly on Christ. Mm-hmm. I, you're still in the fundamentalist mindset. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Like, and fundamentalism can exist on the left end of the spectrum too. Absolutely. There's it, not. It exists everywhere. It exists everywhere. But this idea that I have to go to one denomination because they're the only one who understands the Bible. They're the only one who understands God. That's just not true. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't even have to agree with the church that you go to in order to have community there. We had, uh, like, I know that the church that I was at in Ottawa, we had um, more denominations present at that church than like any. <laughs> other church in ottawa at one point i think or we had estimated like because mm-hmm. like no one was actually that denomination yeah. <laughs> at mm-hmm. the church except for the pastors yeah um, and it worked great and it was fantastic because everyone had different perspectives so yeah you don't have to like become the denomination of whatever church you're at it's just all i'm saying but don't fall into this trap of believing that only one kind of church knows god because that's just not true Mm -hmm. and you know church attendance when you go to church when you get up every week and go to church you're building community you have people around you um that you feel connected to your kids have an extended social uh, social group and a lot of us grew up in church and so we had that personal experience with god as a kid we learned the bible we know what's in the bible and now we've been burned and so we want to stop going to church but if you do your kids aren't going to have that experience and you may be able to stay close to god outside of a church but that's also because of the foundation that you had as a kid, even if a lot of that was toxic, you did know scripture and you knew God, right? And so it is tricky. But what we can tell you is that religiosity is a good thing, but we need to be discerning about mm-hmm. what religious communities we put ourselves in, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Another nuanced question. Awesome. How do you respond to someone who says that purity culture was a good thing? Yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> this is a this great is, one. This is a soapbox that you get on this a lot, is. I'm going to try to keep this short, okay? I'm going to try to keep this short. But here's here's what happens. We who were hurt by purity culture, and I, I mean, I shouldn't really say we. I wasn't hurt that much by purity culture because I thought everyone was dumb and I didn't listen to anyone. But like, I, <laughs> <laughs> like genuinely, that was the biggest protective factor that I had was that I'm <laughs> contrarian. Yes. Um, no, but but people who were scorned by, who were, who were hurt by purity culture, It's easy to assume that then everyone who thought purity culture was good had no good reason. Mm -hmm. That is not the case. Yeah. Um, The opposite of purity culture is not sexual health. Yes. It's sexual hedonism. Yes. Um, Sexual hedonism leads to a lot of really, really bad stuff. Like the hookup culture. The hookup culture and and using people uh, uh, just for for release and for fun is really unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. it just is. You you have people who grew up and they had experiences where they were, they didn't understand about, you know, waiting for sex and they started having sex way too early and they were part of those statistics of people who had sex early and ended up in multiple abusive relationships, sexually abusive relationships as a result, you know. Um, they are part of the statistics of people who uh, sexual promiscuity during high school or early adulthood really threw their life off course. Mm-hmm. Um, they saw people getting pregnant or STDs or just heartbroken and being used. Uh, they saw the negative effects of having sex outside of marriage and then they clamped down because of the fear of the very real risks that they had experienced yeah and this is what i i still don't think people truly get this so speaking as a gen x woman i grew up in the 80s when teenage pregnancy was at an all-time high yeah when they were teenage kids were much more likely to be having sex in the 80s than they are today like we get this idea that everything is getting worse it isn't (laughs) like a lot of purity culture grew out of a time that was really quite toxic Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I, I think, but this is a problem with black and white thinking, absolutely, which is thinking that we either get purity culture or we get hedonism. And it's like, those are not the only two options people. And what we're trying to argue for is the 
middle option. Yeah, where sex is sacred. Sex is something where we take it seriously. We aren't flippant about it. Sex mm-hmm. isn't just some, well, kids just do it. No, they actually shouldn't. We have laws about that. <laughs> like the laws agree that the kids shouldn't be boinking, okay? Yeah. Like this is, <laughs> this is not a thing. But at the same time, you're not a dirty, disgusting, used up, chewed up mm-hmm. wad of gum if you do right like there's there's the middle ground of healthy sexuality that is focused on consent on say on on what does it mean to keep sex sacred mm-hmm. on understanding that chastity is important because it's good for us and good for others and mm-hmm. that it's a way that we can you know be living sacrifices unto god but not because if we give away our most precious gift we'll have nothing to give our husbands yeah right like there's that there's that there's that balance there of no it's actually not okay to just use people even if they say well i'm okay with it because we shouldn't be using people yeah (laughs) Um, and also it's not okay to tell someone well now you're used up and you're worth nothing because they were always worth more than their virginity both of those things exist so that's what we'd say is i understand fully Mm -hmm. why people think that purity culture was a good thing the other thing that a lot of i I, and i i'm hold your pitchforks when i say this Mm -hmm. okay genuinely hold your pitchforks purity culture for a lot of people did help them Mm -hmm. because for a lot of people, the message they got from purity culture was the intended message by a lot of people, which is don't be flippant about sex, only have sex with one person, Mm -hmm. um, marry someone who is a good person, Mm -hmm. um, and then honor God with your body. That's the message that they got. They didn't get the whole, you're a crumpled up rose chewed up gum you're worth nothing if you have sex uh you aren't a good christian you're responsible for him not sinning as the woman Mm yeah and that's why it's important when we're talking with someone who says that you have to define your what your definitions are because mm-hmm. they might just be meaning don't have don't have sex in yeah. high school. Yeah, <laughs> like they might mean yeah no be abstinent. Like that's actually good for kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they they might have a different idea of what purity culture even was than you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they might just not even understand. Yeah. So I yeah. think that's the thing is understand that this stuff didn't exist in a vacuum. This mm-hmm. wasn't some huge conspiracy by like James Dobson to be like how can we make girls feel terrible about themselves? That's not <laughs> what happened. Uh, this ex- this the purity culture came up because of very real threats that were happening uh, to teenagers. Mm -hmm. And it was an overcorrection to the time that was mixed with misogyny and turned into something really quite harmful. But a lot of people got kind of purity culture light and it turned out great for them. Um, And Mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, don't understand and, and that there's I a middle ground. And can I say something? Can I say something to the purity culture light people? Mm-hmm. Remember the thing called survivorship bias. Exactly. Okay. So if you got through unscathed, you may think, well, then it's good. <laughs> but yeah. the fact that you got through unscathed means that, you know, you you, you are biased about this. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people who didn't get through unscathed. And yeah. so everyone's biased. It's not just one side. Okay. I have a last one. Okay. I really liked this question. Okay, and I'll I have, read it so you I have an it. answer to this one. Okay. So I'll read it so okay. you can answer. If you had 10 minutes at dinner with any of these authors or their staff, what would you say? Okay, well, it would depend on which one, first mm-hmm. of all, because I had different relationships with yes. with different of the authors. Um, and for a lot of them, I think my main question would be, I just, and th- this has been my heart cry for a long time, is I just don't understand because I thought you loved Jesus. And if we know this stuff is harmful, why is it so hard to take accountability and to Mm -hmm. make things right? Like, I don't get it because that's been really difficult for my faith journey is seeing these people who are claiming Jesus, but then don't care when people get hurt. So that's Mm -hmm. it. But I had a dream. I don't know if I told you about this. No, but I'm very nervous. (laughs) Okay. I was a couple of months ago and I was going through a rough time and I had this really vivid dream and I was very angry in this dream. I was, I ended up on a panel with Emerson Egrich. I don't know why, um, but I was up on stage in a church and someone brought him out and, and they invited me to say something to him. And in my mind flashed all of the arguments that we have had mm-hmm. about love and respect. And I was trying to figure out which one I was going to blast him with first, but why this was wrong. And then all of a sudden, I had this tremendous feeling come over me. And I turned to him and I said, I am so sorry that you saw your father strangle your mother. Yeah. Yeah. And... You didn't deserve that. No, he was tiny too. Yeah. And increasingly, I'm thinking, 
how much of these people's toxic teachings came out of trauma. And instead of getting doing the trauma work and getting the healing they needed, they yeah. processed that trauma through writing these books that are causing even more trauma. Yeah. But it does come from a root of trauma. And yeah. I just had this dream and I felt I felt such compassion for little Emerson. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That doesn't mean I'm not angry at him. It doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that I don't think he should take his books back. But I've always wondered that question. What would I say? And Mm -hmm. in that dream, I kind of answered it. And I woke up and I'm like, I can't believe I said that to him. And then I thought about it. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That's probably what I would say to him. Yeah, I think that's the right thing. That's probably what I would say to him. Mm -hmm. And I wish someone had said that to him earlier. Yep. Uh, you know, but he so also that, deserved better because he, he was like seven years old. Or yeah, I don't like know. That. I don't know how old he was. Yeah. But yeah, he saw his, his dad strangle his mom. Like, and, and then he got sent to a mil- military boarding school. And like the poor guy, like it is a Charles Dickens novel. Yeah. 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 The problem is, as sad as it is, he caused all of this trauma for all of these other people. Yeah. As did Martha Peace, as mm-hmm. did Stormy O'Martian, who came out of a like an abusive you, marriage, an abusive herself, marriage yeah. as did Jim Daly, who came out of um, a difficult marriage with an alcoholic father. Like mm-hmm. all of these guys had such terrible backstories. Yeah. And it's like, you know, instead of instead of writing books, how about you deal with your trauma? Because mm-hmm. you didn't deserve that. Mm-hmm. You didn't. So anyway, I found out what I would say. <laughs> and it surprised me. <laughs> okay, well, that was fun. We answered a bunch. Yes. Thank you for sending us your questions. Thank yes. you for letting us do a, a, a podcast. We didn't have to spend five hours planning. Yes. Um, because it's been a week. Yeah. It's been a week. And if you appreciate us and if you want to show us a little bit of love, please like our Facebook page and just please encourage do. us. Because as we were watching the numbers tick up yesterday, it's made like, us feel a lot better. Yeah. It's like, oh, look, these people know us and support us. So yeah. And, and if anyone has had a toddler who's immobile for a month and has any great activity ideas, <laughs> uh, pl- leave them in the comments for this podcast. Yes. We are we are recording this like six days i think before yep, so it i'll airs. still have three weeks yes at the point that this comes out yes. or two and a half or whatever yes. um thank you again to our sponsor the kingdom girls bible niv bible please check it out with zonder kids the link is in the podcast notes um the links to join our patron group uh to subscribe to our email newsletter to get our rubric are also there as well um and we just appreciate you guys we appreciate everything we appreciate all the kind messages when all of this mm-hmm. was happening yes thank um, you. but again if you can just team up with us on more than one platform. It is so helpful. And that doesn't just apply to us. That applies to any creator that you love. It is so good to plug in in more than one way. I always knew that at some point something would get hacked because it Mm -hmm. inevitably does. So it didn't surprise me, (laughs) Um, but it's still really demoralizing. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So just plug in in more than one way. And also remember, if you have a creator that you really want to support, some of the best things that you can do is drive engagement on their posts. Mm -hmm. So comment, even if it is just to say, thank you for saying this, even if you have nothing major to add to the conversation, (laughs) leaving a comment is great. Liking other people's comments, um, liking the original post, sharing the original post, all of that drives engagement. And social media platforms run by an algorithm. So when they see, oh, wow, this is a post that people like, they're going to show it to more people. Mm -hmm. Because just because you have like 100,000 thousand followers does not mean your post gets shown to a hundred thousand people. Absolutely. Um it's it's gonna be prioritized if the social media platform knows this is a high quality post. And that applies for every social media platform. But the same also goes in the opposite direction. Mm. Please don't rage comment on terrible trolls or terrible accounts posts yeah. because if someone posts something totally misogynistic and you comment and you comment to a bunch of other people constantly that drives the engagement of their posts yeah it's much better to do it on on posts where it's it's well-meaning people who honestly might not know better versus trolls and rage based the difference between like like, hey focus on the family this was a miss here's Mm -hmm. why versus hey she who shall not be named our patrons know exactly what we're talking (laughs) about um versus people who are truly just rage farms right yeah so Yes. Yeah. And if you really need to share something from them, take a screenshot and share the screenshot. And that way their post doesn't get any engagement. So that's just a little bit about how social media works and how you can support us. So thank you. And join us again next week on the Bear Marriage Podcast. See you later. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>